Hey everyone, I'm Megan McNamara. I'm a certified fertility awareness educator and I make fertility awareness education videos. I also have an online course teaching people how to use this method as effective natural birth control. So if you want more information on that, stay tuned and also check out the link down below. Now today we're answering a question and addressing it from a previous video that I did about cervical mucus and the cervical mucus project. There was so much feedback in the comments on this video a lot of people like thought they had infections, they thought they had cancer or something, um, they were really scared or they just felt really embarrassed about their cervical mucus and um, off the bat I just want to reassure people that cervical mucus is healthy it's normal, you are supposed to have it. And if you are seeing it, that's your body doing its job. Um, and if there's one takeaway that I want you to walk away from this video with, it's that cervical mucus exists on a spectrum and it's gonna look different person to person. So the way that my unique pattern tends to show up and how it tends to look and feel is gonna be different um, from how it tends to look and feel and show up for you. Now to recap, in case you didn't see the previous video, cervical mucus is this hydrogel that is made by your cervix in response to your normal rise and fall of your sex hormones throughout your cycle, primarily estrogen and progesterone. Now the really cool thing is that if you are attentive to your cervical mucus day to day and you're observing and seeing how it changes and alters throughout your whole cycle, that is going to act as a biomarker or a life sign of your fertility and your infertility, how that changes throughout your cycle, but also it's going to act as a um, biomarker of your hormones in real time. So what you're seeing in terms of your cervical mucus is a direct reflection of what's happening with your sex hormones inside. It's an external expression of internal processes that are going on. Now hormones are chemical messengers that affect nearly every part of your body and the cervix is no different. So it's making cervical mucus in response to your sex hormones that are kind of coming and going and rising and falling in that natural ovulation menstruation cycle. So first we're going to talk about kind of the easiest and most general state for someone who who's an adult, um, they've already passed puberty, they're in their reproductive years and before menopause. Um, during that time, for someone who's an adult and they're ovulating and menstruating regularly, what we tend to see is the vast majority of the cycle is actually going to reflect dryness or G mucus. And then only for several days in the cycle, typically in a healthy cycle, about three to five days, but for some people it can look more like a full week. That's when we're actually seeing the outward finger testable, stretchy, clear, etc. Um, e mucus. Again, as I'm talking about this, before you let your mind ask all these questions of like, oh my god, is that me? I don't know. Remember, this is all a spectrum and you do not have to meet this criteria like to the T in order to still be healthy and normal. Another thing I want to emphasize is that it's normal and healthy for your cervical mucus to be in a state of flux and to change throughout the cycle. So again, we're not only only seeing dryness throughout the whole cycle, it's going to naturally ramp up and then ramp back down depending on what's going on with your hormones. And then even when you are seeing your estrogenic cervical mucus, it's still going to vary person to person and also in between cycles, even within one person. So what you'll see will vary in the amount, it's going to vary in how far it stretches, in the color or the clearness, in the texture and sensation, as well as the amount of like water content in a sample. Um, so some people notice, um, like me, I tend to get what's called ES mucus that is fairly, you know, stretchy and clear and it feels really slippery and lubricative, but other people may notice that they have an even higher water content and their cervical mucus is even wetter and it still feels slippery and, and almost like, um, 
like very lubricative um, flaxseed gel, um, but it is more on the watery side because it has a higher water content. So we talked about what healthy estrogenic mucus or e-mucus looks like, but what about g-mucus? Because we've talked about that a little bit. We know the immune function that it serves, but so often people don't necessarily cover how g-mucus can look for people. And that g-mucus is forming because of progesterone in the cycle. That's a hormone that comes out in significant significant amounts only following after ovulation and that's really the only time in our life when it's made is after ovulation and before menstruation. So on G mucus days that's when the environment of the vaginal canal is going to be more acidic and this is going to be reflected as sometimes again ranging from like literal bone dryness on the toilet paper like there's like nothing, okay? <laughs> Sometimes it's going to be a little bit of just dampness on the toilet paper, which is natural for vaginal moisture. Think about the environment of vaginal canal. It's similar to the inside of your mouth. Like, let's take a look. Okay, so if you literally do that and feel the inside of your mouth, it's never going to be bone dry, right? There's going to be a tiny bit of moisture. It's the same exact thing for the vaginal canal. So there's always going to be a little bit of a degree of moisture. And if you wipe that with the toilet paper, yeah, you might come away with a little bit of dampness and that is normal. So those two indications are typical reflections of G mucus. Another aspect of all this that I really want to cover is the idea and the concept of vaginal cell slough. Vaginal cell slough is not cervical mucus. It's something totally different. So true cervical mucus, whether G or E, is made, again, in the cervix, whereas vaginal cell slough is essentially akin to when you go through the day and you shed dead skin cells from your arm, from your leg, like if you've ever scratched your leg and you're just left behind with, like, literal skin cells, that is cell slough from your leg, it's the same thing with the vaginal canal. Every single day of your life, the vaginal canal should be self-cleaning naturally. That is the beauty of the vagina and the vulva is that it really doesn't need very much in order to maintain homeostasis. You really just need to clean externally just with water at the vulva. You do not need to clean internally, period, end of sentence, remember that no douching, okay, seriously, stop it. <laughs> and so that's only going to disrupt the vaginal canal and the pH that it naturally needs there. The pH is going to shift and change depending on where you are in the cycle, um, and that is normal, and we don't really want to be messing with that or affecting that. So you might see cell sloth presenting, again, on the toilet paper, um, and it can look similar sometimes to EL cervical mucus, but there are some key differences. Now, Making these types of distinctions is really, really where I would highly recommend working with a certified FAM educator because I can't convey to you in a short YouTube video the nuances and the subtle differences between some of these observations. Um, we can certainly, you know, take a look at some of the examples, but when it comes to your own cycles and accurately charting these different things so that you can use this information for like your health and wellness or using a full method to, you know, effectively prevent pregnancy, that is going to take some extra steps and extra support. And so working with someone who's certified is going to be really key in being able to do that for yourself. So let's talk about some other circumstances where, um, you know, it's outside of that kind of normal, typical range of an adult in their reproductive years. Let's talk about other circumstances. So we have things like puberty pregnancy, breastfeeding or postpartum, menopause, and then also being on any type of a contraceptive drug or device. This can include things even like non-hormonal IUDs because that is a foreign body inside of you, um, inside the uterus and the cervix that can cause inflammation leading to changes in cervical mucus and other cell slough and discharge. But also being on any type of a contraceptive drug, that is going to be utilizing some degree of synthetic hormones that are going to actively totally suppress the ovulation cycle. So there's a little bit of variation here with something like a hormonal IUD, but generally for the vast majority of different types of contraceptive drugs, so we're talking about different types of pills, shots, patches, vaginal rings, 
um, again, other hormonal IUDs. Um, so there's a range and all of these are meant to shut down the ovulation cycle. Without ovulation, there's no egg being released. And if there's no egg, there's nothing for sperm to fertilize. So that's part of how contraceptive drugs work to prevent pregnancy. Um, but on the, the flip side, again, since there's no ovulation cycle happening, there's really no significant pattern or changes happening with cervical mucus. Now what a lot of people experience is that the contraceptive drug creates a mucus plug in the cervix um, because the synthetic hormones are stimulating that mucus plug to be formed. So if e-mucus crypts are not really being used or stimulated, this is part of why people who are using contraceptive drugs um, may often report a sense of vaginal dryness or even discomfort um, because the pH of the vaginal canal is not changing on that cyclical level throughout an ovulation cycle. Um, so they may experience some discomfort with that. Now in a circumstance like menopause, as you start to shift away from regular ovulatory cycles, your cycles are often going to become longer, more extended, and you may experience changes um, in cervical mucus, like having less of it as you begin to kind of slope down toward your very last cycle. With something like postpartum and breastfeeding, at its core, it's actually very straightforward. When someone is postpartum, the body kind of resets a bit to some degree, and what's happening is there's almost like a dance happening between estrogen and prolactin. And when someone's breastfeeding, the prolactin wants to keep on producing breast milk and not ovulating and feeding the baby that you currently have, whereas the estrogen is like, no, let's get pregnant again, and it's trying to promote ovulation. So one hormone is like really not wanting to get pregnant, the other hormone is like, yeah, let's get pregnant, and they're in kind of a dance that really depends largely on how often the person is breastfeeding and if the baby is actually suckling at the nipple because that's going to stimulate different hormones inside the body as opposed to only pumping um, with something like a breast pump. Now, puberty, this is where we got, I think, the most questions. A lot of people um, were around 10, 11, 12 years old in the last video asking, you know, am I normal? Um, here's what I'm seeing, etc. What I want you to take away from this is that it's very healthy and normal to take one to two full years um, for things to be a bit irregular, for things to finally calm down and settle and regulate when you're starting up menstruation and when you're going through puberty. So if you're noticing that you sometimes have cervical mucus and then it gets dry and then you have it again and then it gets dry again and maybe you're not even having a bleed yet and there's no period in sight but it keeps going back and forth between dryness and e-mucus, that is okay, that's normal. Hang in there, keep going, and keep taking care of yourself. It's great that you're aware of these changes. It's excellent that you're kind of keeping an eye on for it. And also, it's absolutely nothing to be embarrassed about. Cervical mucus is really fascinating. I'm making this whole video about it, in fact. <laughs> and it's really, really cool, and it tells us so much information. Um, it means that your body is doing its job. It's healthy and normal. So I think keep on going, keep on paying attention and checking in with yourself and just holding that compassion for yourself as you go through this time. So next we're going to talk about how unhealthy discharge can look. So if you're seeing discharge that is gray or greenish in color, that could be a symptom of infection and you definitely want to get that checked out with your doctor or qualified healthcare provider so you can get that treated and move on. Another type of discharge that is a symptom of a yeast infection is going to be discharge that is very thick, white, um, chunky. Um, it may be accompanied by a bad odor um, as well as an itching or burning sensation. So you would definitely want to get that treated as soon as possible. Um, one thing important to note with that is that if you do have a yeast infection and you are sexually active, just know that it can be passed back and forth between partners. So if you're the only one treating your yeast infection and then you're noticing that you know after you have sex you tend to get it again definitely you want to have your partner or partners tested and treated for that as well so that everyone can be healthy and move forward next is going to be abnormal spotting or bleeding especially if it's just ongoing and you're not sure of the cause this is where charting your cycle can really really shine because if you're able to determine hey 
I'm actually just ovulating right now and this is just ovulatory bleeding, that is going to give you a huge leg up. And ovulatory bleeding is actually, you know, perfectly healthy. A certain percentage of people experience that and there's absolutely nothing wrong with that. Um, but other things like premenstrual spotting or spotting following on kind of the tail end your, of your period um, or spotting where, again, you're just not really sure why this is happening. Um, if there's no like distinct cause, um, that could be, you know, call for going in with your doctor um, and certainly sharing your charting data with them is going to provide you with so much more information and just context for the cycle um, in terms of what's happening. Now, if you're looking to learn more about all this and how to use the symptothermal method in full to be able to chart your cycle and accurately observe your biomarkers and really be able to interpret for yourself what is going on in your cycle, I'm here for you. I am a certified fertility awareness educator and in my online course, I teach people this method specifically to use as natural birth control. It's highly effective and comparable to any form of contraceptive drugs, just without the side effects. With my online course, I specialize in teaching people how to use this method for natural birth control and body literacy, as well as health charting. Most of my clients either want to um, seriously avoid pregnancy or avoid pregnancy for now, um, and they may be having children in the future, but that really is where my passion lies. I absolutely love teaching people this method, and if you'd like to join me, I'd love to have you. So you can learn more about that. Head to the link in my description to learn about the course. If you have any questions about it at all, you can always schedule a call with me and we can talk one-on-one -on -one to see if it's a good Good fit and just to get all your questions answered. My biggest thing with people taking the course is that they have informed choice when they're signing up for it. So if you have anything that you're just curious about, please reach out to me and I'd love to talk. Now the light is fading for today, so I'm going to start to wrap up this video. I hope you learned something. Please let me know in the comments below. Until next time, guys, I hope you have a great day whenever you're watching this and I'll see you then. Bye.